Good morning. Welcome to Urbana First Baptist on this Labor Day holiday weekend. I trust you're having a good weekend, and that will continue for us. A highlight, of course, is any time we gather in the Lord's house to worship together and, and just to, to give praise to the Lord. And I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, one announcement I want to make, just to make sure there's some clarity, there's a little bit of uh, change in the date and time that was put in the newsletter. This on Afternoon Connection. I encourage you to be a part of that. And thank Joanna for doing the organizing of this. Afternoon Connection will meet on Thursday, September 10th, at the church at 1230. We'll take the church van to Mechanicsburg to have lunch at Simple Comforts, then visit an antique store, wear your facial covering. Please let Joanna Woodburn know if you plan to go or if you have questions. So, again, that is Thursday, uh, September the 10th. So that's coming up this week on Thursday. Also, the business meeting, we have a special business meeting tentatively planned for next week. We are still waiting for uh, roof estimates, and so if that doesn't come in in time, we'll have to delay it another week, but just know that that is coming. Uh, this evening, or this morning, we're going to be uh, looking at the article from our Confession of Faith on the freeness of salvation, the offer of salvation, and coming to the Lord. And there's a beautiful passage of Scripture in the Old Testament that we could preach from. I'm going to be looking at, at John, but for here this morning, listen to uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 7. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you, because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. A beautiful, powerful passage of scripture. Let's pray. Lord, as we read from your word and we hear this stirring invitation to come to you and to know the fullness of life in you. Lord, I pray that as we gather and worship here this morning, that, Lord, this time will be helpful and beneficial to each of us, Lord, to grow closer to you, to, uh, to truly surrender more of ourselves fully and completely to you, uh, to know the, the joy, the indescribable um, peace that comes as we lift up worship and praise to you, trusting all things to you. Lord, as we come before you here this morning, we continue to lift up different concerns and praises to you. Lord, I lift up to you Tim and Heather's baby James, who's continuing to make good progress at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and pray that this may continue, and just pray for his mom and dad with all the trips and things they're doing, that they might have your peace on all of this. And Lord, I continue to lift my father up to you, still in the hospital, and in Arkansas, and pray, Lord, your continued healing hand upon him, and we're thankful, Lord, for the progress that he has made. And, Lord, for others who are dealing with various physical issues and think of Nancy Elliott and, and just having a difficult time and, and weakness, tiredness, we just pray your healing, strengthening hand upon her. And, Lord, for Stacy, as she continues to have rehabilitation from her back surgery and it's causing her a lot of pain. We lift her up to you and pray, Lord, your comforting, healing hand upon her. And, Lord, for others with dealing with different issues, we just lift them up before you and pray that they would look to you and know that you're peace. And, Lord, as we look out upon our world and in our own country and we see a variety of things troubling people, continue dealing with the virus issue, um, the unrest between different people, I, I pray, Lord, particularly for your church. Um, your church made up of all who truly believe in you that's all over this land. Lord, let us rise up, let us speak the truth, let us love, let us show compassion. 
And, Lord, we pray that as we are in you, we know that we uh, bring the light to people as we, uh, Lord, share the truth of you. And so we pray this may be more and more the case. And now, Lord, as we worship here this morning, as we lift our voices to you, and as we think of the offer of salvation, Lord, open these truths to us. We pray and ask in your name. Amen. Please stand. Scripture this morning is John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. John 3, beginning with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, I pray that it will be open to us, to our understanding, to the full, a fuller understanding, Lord. I pray that you would assist me as I bring this sermon that I've prepared, and Lord, help me to to be open to your leading. Lord, I pray that 
these who are listening here, who may be at home listening, Lord, that, that their ears would be open to what you would have to be heard. So we lift this to you and ask it, Lord, in your name. Amen. We come on this Labor Day weekend to Article 6 of our Confession of Faith that deals with the freeness of salvation. Now, the Labor Day holiday is obviously connected with work. Many millions of Americans are looking forward to a day off from work. That is the work that they're paid to do by their employer. Many people will probably work hard on Labor Day on their day off doing various things, but it's a day off from that work that your employer pays you for. When it comes to our salvation from the condemnation that our sin deserves, we need to be clear that there is no work involved in our part. It is all by grace, through faith in Christ alone, by a work of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of God alone. Although most people in the evangelical church would say amen to what I just said, there's actually a significant divide on this idea that it is by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. There's what some call the doctrines of grace on one hand, and what could be called the doctrines of grace with a little bit of work, human response on the other. These are commonly referred to as Calvinism and Arminianism, being named after the men who, know, who most put these things together and the understandings of the different scriptures. Although I might struggle in my humanity with some aspects of the doctrines of grace, the more I submit to the sovereignty of God and the authority of scriptures and study the scriptures, the more I appreciate the doctrines of grace. Consider these thoughts from James Montgomery Boyce. Having a high view of God means something more than giving glory to God. It means giving glory to God alone. This is the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism. While the former declares that God alone saves sinners, the latter gives the impression that God enables sinners to have some part in saving themselves. Arminianism views salvation as something that God makes possible, but that man makes actual. The inevitable result is that rather than depending exclusively on divine grace, salvation depends partly on a human response. So although Arminianism is willing to give God the glory when it comes to salvation, it is unwilling to give him all the glory. Now if we look at our stream of Baptist life in America, we will see that the doctrines of grace, or what is known as Calvinism, was the dominant theological framework. But over time, due to various reasons, this has shifted almost completely to where the doctrine of grace and some human response, or what is known as Arminianism, has become the dominant view. Now, when people who have an Arminian theological framework seek to show the weakness in the doctrines of grace, they often turn to John 3.16. To those who hold the doctrines of grace, though, should welcome a focus upon John 3.16 in the following verses. In fact, every person living on the face of this earth should welcome looking at these great truths from these verses we'll look at in John chapter 3. What we see in this powerful section of Scripture is that salvation is freely offered to all people. The freeness of salvation is described like this in Article 6 of our Confession of Faith. We believe that the blessings of salvation are made free to all by the gospel, that it's the immediate duty of all to accept them by a cordial, penitent, and obedient faith. And nothing prevents the salvation of the greatest sinner on earth but his own inherent depravity and voluntary rejection of the gospel, which rejection involves him in an aggravated condemnation. Well, as we think about the freeness of salvation, as we look at this passage in the Gospel of John, let's begin by thinking about the love of God for the world. John 3.16 begins with these words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, if we're to rightly understand God's love for the world, we need to begin by thinking of God's love for his Son. There is an eternal love and communion between the Father and the Son and the Spirit that we cannot understand. This is part of the mystery of God. There never was a moment when there was not the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They were always in glory and in perfect communion and love. And it's out of this eternal communion that the Father sent His one and only Son into the world to be mocked, to be persecuted, to be spit upon, and then to die as the atoning sacrifice for the redemption of sinners. 
Regardless of how we may struggle to understand the eternal communion of God, it's very clear that God demonstrated his love by sending his son into the world. Think of sacrificial gifts that you have given to those that you love and care about. Maybe you have saved up money or have dug deep into your savings account in order to buy a special gift for a spouse or a son or a daughter or someone else close to you. Or maybe you spent time making something with the labor of your hands, spending hours upon it. Why did you do these things? Because of your love, right? Now imagine doing that for someone who was a scoundrel and didn't care anything about you. And most of us have made this type of sacrifice for someone we care about and possibly even for someone who was a scoundrel and didn't care about us. But can you imagine what it would be like to send your son or daughter to die for someone who was a wretched person? And that is what we are without Christ. We struggle to imagine, yet this is what our Father in Heaven did. Now the hyper-Calvinists might say that God loves only the elect, so handing out evangelistic tracts to say God loves you would be unscriptural. Now although it's true when the word world is used here, it does not mean a universal that everybody is going to be saved. It's a collective of the world. We should know how the scriptures describe the reaction of God when people reject him. Consider two places from scriptures that was in our scripture reading schedule recently. First, Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that he should turn from his ways and live? In Luke 13, verse 34, we read, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. And a little bit later, as Jesus looked over Jerusalem, as Luke records in Luke 19, verse 41, on that Palm Sunday, Luke records, he, he saw the city and wept over it. And it's because God loved the world that he sent his son. And this is the one and only message for all the world. Every human being starts from the position of being condemned. This has been true since the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. Listen again to verse 17. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world. This could also be translated as to condemn the world. But that the world might be saved through him. In other words, Jesus didn't come, he came on a rescue mission, not to destroy. There's no path for any person to be saved through their condemned condition except through Christ alone. The Lord Jesus commissioned his church to proclaim this great message to the whole world. Each born-again believer has a calling to tell the good news, the gospel to the world, beginning with our personal world, our sphere of influence, our oikos. We've talked a little bit about God's love for the world. Do you have a love for the world? Your personal world? If so, share the message of John 3.16 with them. We should spend more time truly thinking about people's true condition and what they most need. And about that offer of salvation we looked at from Isaiah 55. Come to me who are thirsty and get without cost. Now, as we share the message of John 3.16, let's remember that whoever believes in Jesus is saved. Listen again to the second half of John 3.16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We should also keep in mind, if we think about this, that no one ceases to exist after physical death. Everyone continues eternally. What's made clear is we, what is clearly intended here in John 3.16, as we look at the rest of the Gospel of John, is the one who is truly born again and believes on the Lord Jesus will not experience eternal punishment and the torment of hell. I'd like to caution us to not take lightly this what this call to believe means. It's not just a simple, yeah, that's true or probably true. It, it's a total surrender, a, a total trust, giving yourself to. Let me give you a simple illustration. I believe that eating spinach and other green leafy stuff, along with baked turkey and organic eating sliced organic apples, 
would be healthier for me than eating steak, baked potato with butter, and corn on the cob with butter, hot yeast rolls with butter on it, and warm apple pie. I can say that I believe this, but I don't really believe it, experience the benefits of it, until I move beyond just saying in a mental belief. John's use of the Greek word translated here as believes in him carries the idea of surrender to, wholehearted acceptance, trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. It'd be like you seeing me drive right on by the Texas Roadhouse on my way to Whole Foods to go get some spinach and other delicious stuff. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke rarely use the phraseology believing in Christ. John used it over 30 times. It's part of his theme of being in Christ and Christ being in us that comes from truly being born again. And when we're truly born again, we are changed. We no longer have that incessant need to be in control, but we're gladly under his lordship. We believe in him. Our changed behaviors reflect our changed condition. As I suggested last week, if there's no changed behaviors, it's a good indication there's been no change in the condition. One is still in the place of condemnation. Now, the Greek of John 3.16, where it says, whoever could also be translated as everyone, listen to this translation from the Christian Standard Bible. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This leads us to consider another truth that we find in the scriptures. Although salvation is freely offered to all people, the offer of salvation is freely rejected by many. You could even say most. Let's consider the reality of the rejection. The scriptures tell us this will be the case. Consider a place we're told this from our scripture reading this past week, Luke chapter 13, and read verses 22 to 28. Luke 13, beginning with verse 22. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. Matthew's telling of this is a little bit different. Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. We're going to consider briefly this morning those who enter through the narrow gate and why, but clearly the scriptures teach that many will, by their free will, choose to remain on the other way. The scriptures tell us this is the case, and certainly we see evidence in the world around us. There is very little fear of God. People are doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. Actually, we probably should just say people increasingly seem to be doing whatever they want to do, whether it's right or not, or just changing what is wrong to say it's right. The truth of the matter, though, is that there's really not been a change from the time of the New Testament to today. You know, from our perspective, it looks like there's increasing manifestations of sinfulness and people rejecting the way of salvation. But just in the time of the New Testament, so it is today, the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. So we may ask, we should ask, why is this? The simple answer is people reject the way of salvation because they choose what they desire. Listen again to the second half of Article 6 from our Confession of Faith. Nothing prevents the salvation of the greatest sinner on earth but his own inherent depravity 
and voluntary rejection of the gospel, which rejection involves him in an aggravated condemnation. The inherent depravity is another term for original sin or sin nature. What's the extent of this depravity, this sin problem? Is it total? Or does there remain a little bit of goodness that we can develop in to then choose the right things? Let me put it another way. Spiritually speaking, are we sick or are we dead? Are we sick or are we dead? Well, the scriptures are quite clear on this. In Romans 3, verse 11, we read, There is none who understand. There is none who seeks for God. Ephesians 2, verse 1, we read, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In our natural state, in our state of total depravity, we are spiritually dead and have no desire to submit to the Lordship of Christ, desiring the things of the Lord, but instead we are happy just living our lives, enjoying and going about doing what we want to do. When it talks about evil deeds, what we need to keep in mind is not about going out stealing and robbing and so forth. It's about rejecting the Lord and His call upon our lives. We desire things of the world. We exercise our free will to choose and do what we desire. Our rejection of Christ is voluntary in accordance with our sin nature. And then this voluntary rejection, as our confession states, involves us in an aggravated condemnation. Because of the fallen Adam and Eve, we have the sin nature and we're in a state of condemnation. And then we confirm that, we confirm that condemnation by our voluntary rejection of the gospel. Now if you ask ten people what condemns a person to hell, of those who believe there is hell, many do not believe, but those who do believe, you'd probably hear some version of bad person, bad behavior, bad thoughts, stealing and killing, being crude, mean, vulgar, and so forth. Well, listen to the second part of verse 18 there in John 3. He who does not believe has been judged or condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Charles Spurgeon stated very simply and clearly in one of his sermons, he said, When men rejected Moses, they perished without God's mercy, for he was sent of God. But when a man despises the only begotten, in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, we may well say, Call no witnesses against the man. Rake up none of the details of his past life. This is quite evidence alone that he rejects Christ. Listen again to verses 19 and 20. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. It's a terribly sad truth that many people choose to stay on this path, but it's not God forcing them to stay on the path. Instead, they're freely choosing what they desire. All the scriptures and the evidence around us tell us that many people reject the way of salvation that's freely offered to all. Praise be to God. There are many who do believe on the Lord Jesus and are saved. Let's think briefly this morning on this truth. Those who accept the offer of salvation do so through God. Think just a little bit about the glorious change from being condemned to being saved, from a situation of condemnation to be justified. This is what Article 6 of our Confession refers to as the blessings of salvation. Remember, all people start in a state of being condemned, spiritually dead in this life and subject to the wrath of God at the day of judgment. Life in this state is lived on the horizontal plane. It's in our relationships with one another, doing the kind of things we want to do. Um, many people having a good life, enjoying life, going through, but it's lived on the horizontal plane without reference to God. Now, certainly on one level, there may be many things we call good and enjoyable, but it's almost always limited in scope, and it's essentially self-centered. 
it focuses on self. And with the rarest exception, on the other hand, in the life of every unsafe person, there are many acts, words, and thoughts that could clearly be labeled as sinful. Often these things remain hidden from others, at least for a while. While we're in this state, we fear the light because we don't want our deeds to be exposed. We don't want to surrender to another. We want to be in control of our life. We want to be making our choices. We don't want to be robbed of something. We like the pleasures and the things that we're doing, our lives we're living. Without the love of God in us, we will go through this life basically focused on self and then most often become bitter as hardships come. And as death draws close, there will be a particular dread. And whether we believe it or not, the eternal torment of hell awaits. But what a glorious change when a person truly believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. When this change comes in, there is a desire uh, to love others as God loves us. The person in Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit and manifests the fruit of the Spirit. And this is big. There's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Justify. No condemnation. The shame and the guilt is lifted. There may remain apprehension about death, but the dread is relieved as one thinks on the resurrection, the eternal life that we have in Christ. Oh, glorious day when a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and is saved, born again. The question is, how does this come to be? Well, there's no cause for boasting. Remember, on our own, we are spiritually dead with no desire for the things of God. We have free will to choose what we desire, but what we desire is life without Him, the darkness. Consider again verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So we come to the light to show that all of our deeds, whatever it is, all of our life is not of us, it is through God. Everything is wrought in him, it's through him, it's to him be the glory. D.A. Carson coming on this verse said, This strange expression makes it clear that the lover of light is not some intrinsically superior person, if he or she enjoys the light, it's because all that has been performed, for which there's no shame or conviction, has been done through God in union with him and therefore by his power. In other words, what we see here in John 3.21 is the truth that it is God who works in us to give us a new disposition, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit so that we'll have the desire of the things of God and then believe on the Lord Jesus. In our scripture reading this past week, we were looking at his, one chapter was Ezekiel 36 where he was telling the Israelites that he would give them a new heart, a heart of flesh, a new spirit, taking out the heart of stone and giving them the heart of flesh. In other words, instead of a dead heart, a living heart, alive in Christ is what we're looking for. We'll think about this more next week when we consider Article 7 of grace and regeneration. But as we finish here this morning, let me go back to Ephesians 2 for a moment. Earlier we saw in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were children of wrath, no desire for God. This change that comes is certainly not because we muster up faith from some vestige of human goodness to choose what is right. The reason that we do is because we, we do what is right, and while our neighbor is just not as knowledgeable or, or, or is not as good as we are and chooses what is wrong, no. The glory belongs to God alone. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5 and 8 to 9. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. There's no cause for boasting in any fashion. For anyone who truly believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is by grace alone to the glory of God alone. It is not by God's grace and then a person 
work of responding rightly. It is alone by God's grace of choosing to make one alive in Christ. When the grateful and redeemed person cries out, and I trust you've had these sort of thoughts, why am I the recipient of God's mercy and salvation? When I see others around me just going on and denying, rejecting, no desire. Why me? Why do I say, why am I the recipient of his mercy and his salvation? From the resounding answer from the scriptures is this. It is by his grace alone. To God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, your abounding grace, your work of changing us, making us new creations, through your sacrifice upon the cross, atoning for our sin, your righteousness given to us. We can't fathom these things, Lord. And we cry out, Lord, why me? And the answer comes is by your grace alone. Oh, Lord, thank you for your great love. Lord, I pray that any who has not experienced this joy of new life in you, and Lord, as you speak to them, I pray that they would humble themselves before you, surrender to you, and to know this joy. And I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, cause us who have trusted and follow you, Lord, to have an increasing desire to share the good news of the gospel with a hurting world. Lord, thank you for these great truths. Thank you for your love for us and that we have life in you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, it's, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. And I trust that you picked up one of the communion cups on your way in. I'm going to be looking at passages from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If anyone does not have a cup, Lindsay has a tray with some cups on it. Just She'll bring it to you if you just want to lift your hand up if you don't have one of those cups. Bring 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. As we come to the time of communion, we're reminded of the high cost, exceedingly high cost of our salvation. We've spoken of the freeness of salvation. And we do no work. But Christ did the full work, the only work that could satisfy by the shedding of his blood upon the cross. And through him we have forgiveness of sin. And we have the assurance of life forever. I want to pause and just have a moment of silent prayer just for you to pray and Think on these things and lift up your thanks to the Lord. Examine yourself of your showing your joy and, and your trust in the Lord. So let's pray quietly together.
Oh Lord, we come with thanksgiving to your table as we're reminded that you, with the bread that you gave your body and the, the cup reminded us of your blood which was shed for us so we might have the forgiveness of our sin and have new life in you. Lord, as we take this bread and drink this juice, Lord, let us do it with a humbleness, a thankfulness, and a gratefulness to you, Lord. For we ask in your name. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for this ordinance you've given to us to help us keep ever before our minds our total dependence upon you. Lord, may we desire to walk rightly with you and be those who joyfully proclaim the truth to all people so that your name might be lifted up. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The praise team is going to lead us in our song of response. We worship the Lord. Please stand. Oh, Lord, may it be that in our life, in our church, in our home, in all that we are, that you be glorified. Lord, we continue to give you thanks for the joy of coming together and worshiping you. And now as we depart from this place, may we go with your blessing and your peace. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let me not be blind.